the front State University patient studies. Um, my name is here. I'm a faculty member in civil and environmental engineering, and together with my colleague Rob Bertini and Jennifer Dill, we co organize these uh, Friday transportation seminars. We used to have Matthew Kitchen from the Puget Sound Regional Council to talk about traffic choices. of uh, approaching highway finance and also uh, some new strategies for thinking about managing some of our congestion, roadway congestion problems that we have in that area. I'm going to start a little bit by talking about who we are and who I am so you get, a, uh, a get sort of oriented with what we're talking about here. Um, I work at an agency called the Puget Sound Regional Council. We're a what's called a metropolitan planning organization. That's a uh, planning organization that's designated under Federal Highway Administration um, to really handle transportation planning in what for our case is a four county uh, region around the greater Seattle area. Um, we're, um, we're a pretty quickly growing region. Um, we have uh, already have some significant congestion issues in our roadways. Uh, but we're going to be growing pretty quickly over the next 20 or 30 years, and uh, we have to start thinking of some new ways to um, both finance some of our investments that we need in that region, but also to uh, manage some of the congestion problems uh, in ways that don't necessarily always require us to make significant new capacities and new investments in highway capacity. Um, a little background on how we got to. Uh, the point of even beginning to think about a project like the one I'm going to talk about today. Uh, really, we started uh, a number of years back with uh, some of our, our board members were a member organization made up of local elected officials. And really, during the course of developing regional plans, transportation plans, uh, we spent some time thinking about the state of, uh, highway, of transportation finance. and. Um, it's hard to spend any time with the current finance situation and not come away with some pretty um, stark conclusions about uh, the future role of existing tax sources. And um, especially when you think about that problem within the larger context of how we actually manage the roadways that we use and the lack of direct management through price, which is typically in most markets, a reasonably way, a reasonably good way to start uh, managing some supply and demand imbalances. So uh, we spent some time talking about this and really concluding that we needed to start looking at some uh, more direct user charges as a way of um, safeguarding against changes in the future our ability to make investments. Um, we've tried, as in is in the case probably here in the Portland area. Uh, we've tried lots of different ways of solving some of the uh, existing congestion problems or mobility problems in our region, which is another part of this equation. And um, you know, they they all serve some function. And you know, you may see your your favorite strategy up there somewhere. But the reality is, um, at least the way in which we've been making these investments so far, it simply hasn't made the problems go away. I mean, there's no way that under our current planning scenario that we can make significant enough investments in any of these individual approaches to obviate the problem uh, on the congested roadways. So we have to start thinking about the way in which markets uh, help to manage uh, some of these problems for us. Um, so we really started to focus on direct uh, charges for use of infrastructure as a long-term potential strategy um, on the finance side. And essentially what we're talking about is congestion pricing. Um, uh, it, you can think about this in other contexts as well as it relates to transit, as it relates to um, other kinds of investments we make. But essentially right now what we're talking about is trying to uh, develop a better understanding about what the potential is for um, direct charges for roadway use. And that's really where we start the story, which is uh, um, how we 
essentially got to the point where we decided we needed to develop a, a demonstration project to uh, build some familiarity with some of these concepts in our region. So we applied for some funds from the Federal Highway Administration, the same pool of funds that the Oregon Road User um, Project uh, is uh, is um, been funded through, and um, we started what is essentially a extended behavioral study. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who's involved in this. Obviously, Federal Highways is the um, is the funding agency. We, the regional council up in the Seattle area, are administering this project, but we're partnering with our state DOT. Um, we've got some uh, some good folks or technical advisors on this project, and we have of course, uh, a good set of consultants and a vendor, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, further as we go. Um, but most importantly, uh, you'll notice now at the bottom here is we have participants in our project. This is a demonstration project. We need actual folks to be part of our project. We need to understand behavior, so we need uh, the participants become a very important component. And essentially, there are customers in the course of this 12-month uh, uh, project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall uh, design of the project so you understand uh, the core concepts, and then we'll get into some details. Um, so really what we were trying to do, the most important thing we were trying to do was we were trying to understand the way in which people would behaviorally respond to having to pay charges for accessing roadway infrastructure especially where those charges would vary under a, set, a, a, a changing set of demand conditions, so time of day or day of the week or the type of road that they were trying to access. And what we're trying to understand is the way they will modify behavior or alternately may not modify behavior in response to this price. But as a consequence of actually doing this behavioral study, we have... Um, a variety of other things that we're trying to achieve as well, of course. And maybe one of the most important is simply familiarizing people with the, the basic concepts of paying for access to roads. And um, there's a range of very important, as you will, as will become clear as we proceed, there's a range of very important policy questions that come along with uh, this kind of a project. Everything from privacy to fairness, uh, um, and a range of institutional questions, a, ra a range of legal questions. So, um, and, and finally, we really are, are essentially testing technology and the design of the program. I'll say that the technology we're, we're using uh, will be very familiar to most of you. It's not, um, this is not uh, a new technology. It's simply being used in a slightly different way. So, um, this is not a cutting edge uh, project in that regard. Um, so essentially, we're trying to understand the system-wide effects of congestion pricing on our roadways. Um, we, we knew right away that we were, uh, given the complexity of the project and the limits of our budget, that we were not in a position to uh, uh, develop a toll. Essentially, what we're doing is developing a toll system. We're building a toll system from the ground up, and we need to uh, do that with a very limited budget. And it's a behavioral project, and the behavioral component of this project will take up most of our budget. So we needed to have a way to build the toll system that was reasonably low cost to us during the course of this project. The only way we could do that, we concluded at least, was to look to existing technology, essentially an off-the-shelf product, an off-the-shelf system. And so that's what we've, uh, we've got. This is a tolling system that is very unlike uh, the kind of electronic toll system that you'll, you may encounter as you travel around the U.S. or in other parts of the world. Typically, electronic toll collection uses short-range communication technology with a transponder in the vehicle and roadside equipment, and the vehicle communicates with roadside equipment, um, and uh, the toll transaction occurs in that way. Uh, we were not in a position, of course, to be able to build or invest in significant roadside equipment, so we concluded early on that we would be developing essentially what we would call a GPS-based toll system or a, a toll system based on vehicle positioning technology. And, um, of course, that requires some 
still requires some communication component. So our project uh, is essentially using the cell network, uh, sending data over uh, the cell network to a central system or a back office. So those are really the attributes of the project as we went into this. We knew that this was exactly essentially what we had to uh, develop. So obviously, a lot of details still needed to be worked out at that point. We also needed to have uh, to meet our behavioral uh, study requirements. Uh, we needed a sufficiently large sample size to be able to say something meaningful about uh, behavioral results. Um, we needed to have a very high degree of network resolution. And what that means simply is we were not interested in simply tolling in this project, in this study, and tolling individual facilities. We know a lot about how people respond behaviorally to tolls as they're applied on an individual facility. We were looking at a network, uh, a network solution with most of the roadways in our region represented, and that's a pretty extensive network. We also needed to deal with the installation question. It's a huge question, and so we needed something that could be installed reasonably easily. Uh, we needed something that could capture an incredible amount of travel information or vehicle position information. And you'll see what we mean by that in a little bit later. This is just the broad architecture for the system. It's uh, essentially what we went over before verbally, but we have ro uh, vehicles on the roadway. They're equipped with these, think of them as little taxi meters. Um, and they communicate with the back office through the cell, cell network. Uh, and then there's a variety of both user and administrator interfaces, essentially through the, uh, through the web. Now this, this looks very different from the kind of broader architecture you would see for some other kind of toll systems, because essentially we, don't, we haven't built an enforcement component in this project. And that, if you're uh, familiar with uh, how toll, elect especially electronic toll systems operate, uh, enforcement is a huge percent of what you really have to deal with when you're designing a toll system. So enforcement's a big deal. The onboard unit itself, I have one, so I'll show it to you right here. It's, uh, it's a very attractive de device designed by our friends in Germany. Um, Siemens is the vendor on this project. A small, very small German corporation. You may be familiar with them. They may have, maybe they built your uh, your refrigerator or something, who knows what. But um, uh, this device is mounted in the vehicle on the dashboard. Um, and it's um, uh, wired into the vehicle wiring harness uh, for power. And, um, and it's an onboard computer. It has, uh, a, it has to store a digital version of our roadway network. And it has a GPS receiver and it has a a GSM uh, uh, communication, a little SIM chip in there for, uh, for the communication module. And it uh, also has a display. And uh, so the display is important because it tells our participants what the tolls are that they're going to be paying when they drive on roadways. Um, we, for those of you or some of you I know involved in GIS, uh, uh, we as a regional council, we have a base map for our roadway network. Um, any of you who are familiar with digital roadways, uh, roadway files know there are accuracy problems associated with those files. So we, uh, uh, you combine that with the measurement accuracy difficulties associated with that are, can be present with GPS receivers, and you have a non-trivial map matching problem to solve. So we spent significant time in refining our, road, our digital road network uh, just for this project, per, just for the purposes of this project, and did extensive roadway testing with the device uh, once we had the vendor on board. Um, and um, then the vendor itself, because this is a, essentially a toll system that was designed uh, for uh, purposes of heavy vehicle tolling in Europe, um, they already had uh, a set of mat matching uh, strategies or algorithms embedded in their software that allow us to overcome some of the uh, measurement or accuracy limitations of uh, both the underlying base map and the GPS reception. This is a big component of what this pro essentially the technical component of this project. Um, 
This just gives you a sense of a small area in our region, what the roadway network looks like. And I'll spend just a minute maybe going over this. Um, if, uh, what you see, and it may be difficult for the viewing audience to see, but is a series of uh, circles on uh, an underlying roadway uh, network file. And these are, um, what these represent are um, entry points into the road, into an, uh, an individual link in our roadway file. And um, so the circle that I'm highlighting here is an entry point for four different links. And um, to be able to accurately know that you're on an individual link in the network, you have to have a GPS reception, GPS coordinate that's received by the unit itself that's within this geographic region. And then you also have to have a GPS received coordinate that's within another specified point on the roadway network in order to get a successful match for an individual roadway link that you're driving on. That's the underlying concept. It gets a little more sophisticated than that, but um, that's generally how the map matching process works. So ultimately, though, we needed real people to be involved in our project. So um, we um, had an experimental design issue to resolve. And um, we, had a, uh, we had to actually go out and recruit and equip people for this project. So that was really the startup period, uh, developing the core components of the technology, getting our participants uh, on board, equipping the participants. Um, and then we started collecting data from these folks. Uh, the data um, that we were collecting in the baseline period was very important, be not just because this is a behavioral pro uh, study, but because we also needed to be able to, uh, for this project, the, the missing piece probably for everybody in this project is, how do we understand behavioral response if what we have is a set of participants who simply have a, a unit in their vehicle that's collecting information on where they drive? To, for this to be a behavioral study uh, related to tolling, we need to expose them to tolls on the infrastructure. So um, how we did this was essentially by developing for each household uniquely a travel budget based on their baseline, uh, the baseline travel behavior during the baseline the data collection period. Um, this travel budget then, when we went live with tolling, was provided for them uh, in their account information, in their web account. So they could log on, find out what the travel budget is, and then they would essentially, over the course of the experimental portion of the, period of the project, they would be paying tolls out of that travel budget. And at the end of the study period, whatever the balance is in their budget, they keep so that there will be an actual economic incentive for them to economize. Um, so that was uh, the other component of this startup period. Then July 1st, we went live with tolling. Um, this is pretty, uh, essentially pretty straightforward. Uh, we turn tolling on in the system. Suddenly, the tolls start being displayed in the onboard unit. And we provide them, the participants, with a range of other ways to understand the tolls that they will pay over the course of the project, both in terms of printed materials and in terms of their, their access to their web account, which allows them to um, understand the toll, not only uh, the, the, to the toll structure, but also track the tolls they've paid over time. This is the, uh, our, uh, our project timeline, we, uh, the important thing about this, I think, is that we, uh, we've gone to a pretty extensive lengths to uh, ensure that what we have is a legitimate behavioral experiment. So we have, a, we have what we call a crossover design. Uh, we have two control periods. We have one in the beginning of the, pro uh, one at the, beginning of the project, then we have an experimental treatment, and then we go back to another control period where we essentially turn the tolls off. We tell these folks that they're, they're done, but we keep the, the units in their vehicles for another six weeks so that we can, we can once again collect uh, what we would consider to be um, some base level of travel information on these people. Uh, gives us a little more uh, of a robust uh, base upon which to uh, make some of these uh, 
uh, measurements about behavioral change. We have currently in ex just over 400 units out there driving around. They've been, uh, we've been live um, with tolling since July 1st, and um, and this is uh, roughly 270, a little over 270 households. Um, uh, these, these folks were uh, the randomly selected uh, from what we, what, we're calling, what we call an enriched pool of potential participants. We, uh, uh, we obviously couldn't uh, spend significant resource in trying to collect information from people that we, ex ante, we believed would be simply non-responsive. So we had to uh, structure our sample uh, such that we thought uh, they had some, these, the folks who would be part of our project would have some potential to respond to the experimental treatment. We obviously needed people who had vehicles. That was a fundamental requirement. We needed people who drived under some kind of congested conditions in our, in our region. Uh, and we needed people who uh, primarily were not already uh, transit users on a regular basis. And they also had, but they also had to have some transit availability. Uh, we thought it was important that um, they have some, uh, not only route, time of day, but potentially uh, modal options available to them so that we could begin to observe some of those kinds of changes. That means we have um, not a purely uh, random sample anymore, but simply a representative sample. Then we have to be able to reverse that engineering at the back, the back end of the project to be able to generalize these results to the broader population. But it also meant that this was a pretty um, onerous recruitment exercise. We, um, I think, we contacted in excess of 100,000 folks, 100,000 households, to be uh, to finally get down to just about 300 who agreed to participate and who met our criteria. Give you a sense of what kind of dollar, what kind of um, what amount of money is actually at stake for some of these people. To show you that in some sense it really is uh, uh, for some of these people. This is a this isn't a trivial thing. Um, the, the average household is, you know, the bulk of the households are have at stake in their travel budget somewhere between five hundred and two thousand dollars over a ten-month period. Uh, but some of these people who drive a lot during their baseline period, some of these households actually had uh, three, four, uh, five thousand dollars at stake. So, to the degree that they can actually avoid paying the tolls that we would expect that they would normally have paid under unmodified uh, behavior, um, they could come away from this project with some non-trivial amount of money. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is this map of our roadway network. Um, it's uh, really two classes of roadway. It's highways and arterials, uh, uh, primary arterials and secondary arterials. and uh, they each have uh, different toll values. The arterials are always essentially half the value of the, of the toll value on the highway network. Uh, but the, uh, the tariff model uh, also varies by, um, by time of day and day of week. So this is trying to replicate congestion, what we would essentially think of as uh, efficient tolling, economically efficient tolling. Um, and um, and then the weekends are treated differently. We have obviously different kinds of traffic loading in the weekends than we do on the weekdays, and uh, we tried to reflect that in the tariff model. So, uh, if you're driving on the freeway network in the morning, as I did this morning coming down here, um, you would pay uh, forty cents a mile. Uh, in the afternoon peak, it go, it's up as high as 50 cents a mile. And um, as you can imagine, um, uh, when you start with the premise of sort of economically efficient tolls, um, you face a multidimensional problem in terms of how you specify the toll values. Uh, you could make this much more richly complex than we have uh, made the toll structure, but the problem, of course, is it becomes very difficult to communicate to people. If people can't understand the tariff model, uh, at least within a reasonably quick period of having imp implemented this or having uh, 
been exposed to these tolls, then you're simply not able to collect any meaningful behavioral data. So um, we've got to compromise, essentially simple, simplify this structure to the, mo to the point where people can understand it somewhat intuitively. Um, the onboard unit itself displays uh, a, 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 a few pieces of information. It tells you uh, the road you're on, uh, shortened name of the road. It tells you the toll per mile that's currently in force. And the top uh, line of the display shows the cumulative total for the given trip that the participant is taking. So in this case, um, uh, in the case of our project, a trip is uh, driving behavior between states of ignition. So you turn the vehicle on and you initiate a trip. When you turn the vehicle off, the trip is over. Give you a sense of uh, the kind of information that we're collecting. Maybe I'll just come out of this for a moment and uh, show you my trip down here this morning. Uh, I started in Seattle, um, and I stopped in Olympia. So that was one trip. Uh, and the next leg, leg of my trip took me from Olympia. I won't show you, but it took me from Olympia um, to, uh, to just outside of Portland, where I stopped to get some gas. But um, so there's an extensive amount of uh, data that we're collecting for uh, each of the trips that are taken for all of our participants. With a lot of information uh, being s collected and stored somewhere, you have to answer the question of how you treat that information. And this has broad implications uh, on a number of fronts. It has privacy implications. It has um, data security implications. It has um, uh, system reliability implications. And um, currently, uh, our, uh, the toll system we have Store, both stores the data on the device uh, temporarily and also sends the data in all the data that's stored on the device gets sent to the back office. So the calculation for the tolls is performed in two separate locations. It's performed on the unit, uh, within the unit. That allows the unit to actually display the information to the user in a way that they can understand. But the final calculation for billing purposes is done in the back office. Now, that's uh, redundant, obviously. But um, it was important that we have both the functionality of the unit itself to sh display the information to the participant and also to be able to ensure that we had an accurate calculation that was done in the back office. Um, <clears throat> you know, the uh, fundamental limitation uh, is the unit itself. Uh, which is really a hardware software limitation. Uh, currently, it is limited to the amount of data that can be stored. Those are solvable issues. But the rest of the questions are really uh, more fundamental about the reliability of your system when you have, it's one thing to have 400 of these units uh, out there um, uh, doing their thing. It's another thing to have three or four million of them out there and to ensure that each one has the most uh, up-to-date uh, version of all the software and the tariff model and the toll network is a non-trivial um, systems engineering problem. Um, also, uh, on the other hand, uh, to have everything happen in the back office uh, has some clear privacy implications that need to be carefully thought through. So that's really one of the areas that um, I think there'll be a lot more thinking on this over a number of years before anybody is even uh, close to implementing something like this. The user themselves um, have a web interface uh, for their account. Um, each one of the uh, lines in the table at the bottom uh, of this display is a trip record. And each trip record has all the various time and location stamp coordinates associated with it that the user can uh, review. Turns out, of course, location stamp information is not particularly meaningful to most people. <laughs> Set of x, y coordinates. But they are able um, to see the distance of the trip, uh, the
the number of tolled miles, the tolls that they paid during the course of that trip, and um, uh, they also they're able to understand the individual roads uh, that they used during the uh, during that individual trip. Of course, this is a lot of information. Um, we uh, we need all this information to be able to ultimately estimate demand elasticity under a range of conditions. Um, we uh, but what we're talking about in terms of data volume is uh, somewhere in the range of a half million trips over the course of this project for just these uh, 270 households, and probably somewhere in the range of about 20 million individual time or location stamp points. Um, and um, so we have a, you know, a reasonably large um, database to deal with. Um, but we're expecting, of course, uh, this is behavior we're expecting to observe is going to be uh, sort of behavioral change at the margin. And so um, we need to, uh, it's going to be quite an interesting analytical exercise to, uh, when we're finally done with this project, to uh, eke out the behavioral response information. Um, you know, one of the things we will obviously be able to directly observe is, is all of the kinds of behavioral responses that people uh, engage in. We will see when they change route. We will see when they change in general when they modify the time of day of their trip making behavior. We won't see, we won't directly observe their use of transit, for example, as a potential alternative to driving altogether. Or we won't be able to, we will only observe avoided trips as a function of um, their, uh, their absence in our database. So we'll be doing some survey work to try and fill in some of those pieces uh, of our understanding. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit, just a briefly, a little bit of our, um, of our data that we've uh, collected so far uh, with the understanding, of course, that really the, the uh, making sense of this data relies upon our ability to do some pretty heavy lifting and the econometric work at the end of the project. So we haven't done any of that. All we can do is sort of look at some trends in the data. Frankly, uh, you have to be really careful uh, to draw conclusions from that. Um, so uh, we're really looking at it at this point just to make sure that we're getting information that looks reasonable, that uh, can give us some information about how we structure the analytical process differently than we might have otherwise structured it given what we're seeing coming in. Um, so it's a little bit, probably, a little bit, there's a lot of numbers here. It's a little bit difficult to see. But what, what we've got so far is about 300,000 trip records from these households. We've uh, we're able to look at some things that are of interest uh, to us uh, outside of the scope of this project. Um, we obviously, as a planning agency, do other kinds of uh, survey work. We have to support travel demand modeling. We need to be able to understand uh, um, uh, the actual conditions out on the roadways to calibrate models. So we're going to be able to collect speed information on individual facilities. We'll be able to um, we'll be able to look at um, the average trip duration. We'll be able to look at. Um, we'll be able to look at average trip distances. Well, what we're finding right now, of course, is already some significant, well, some important differences between what we're observing, directly observing from vehicle trip data in our database, compared to the kind of written diary surveys that we've historically done. Um, and you know, it's pretty. Well understood that there's a tendency to under there's a tendency to underreport trip activity simply because people don't uh, people don't always think of trips in the way we ask them to think of trips when we ask them to report trips in a trip diary and uh, so we're seeing sort of a higher level slightly higher level of vehicle trip activity than one would uh, one would conclude was out there uh, when observing just the the the, um, the diary data that people provide for us. Um, we're able to, we'll be able to uh, organize this data by um, day of the week, by time period, so that we can uh, see a range of trends. This is some, we've got some information about how weekday and weekend trip behavior changes and the tolls that people seem to be paying or the trip that people are making on toll facilities uh, during the weekday versus the weekend. Um, and, um, Ultimately, we will, of course, be looking at the experimental period and the control period 
Uh, that's really what we're going to be interested in from a behavioral perspective. So what we're seeing already is, um, again, not to draw real conclusions from this, but what we're seeing is if you look at what the average toll per household during the experimental treatment versus the baseline period, it's going down very slightly. Meanwhile, the, um, the uh, toll miles that people are driving is going up. Well, this is not uh, inconsistent with something that we might expect to see in the form of uh, potentially, without knowing this to be true, but potentially what we may be observing is um, a diversion behavior off of uh, the higher priced roads onto the lower priced roads that actually uh, increase the trip length. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll be doing obviously um, some much more sophisticated analysis when we get a full data set. These are, uh, this is just an example of a few, uh, th in this case, three different households. Um, what you're seeing in this uh, table is um, the told miles that these individual households uh, drove summed over each week of their participation. The dotted red line here is um, when the baseline period stopped and where the, where the experimental treatment began. And you see maybe the most uh, obvious thing you see in the data is a huge degree of variability in trip making activity over from one week to the next in any given household. And this is consistent through almost all of the participants. Um, it probably, if you think about your own life, it's consistent as well. You're just seeing a huge and unexpected amount of uh, trip making variability from one week to the next. Obviously this makes the analytical process um, even more complex. Um, you have a huge amount of natural variability in your data. Um, I fitted lines to these. They, those fitted lines mean nothing except to simply, um, I mean it's not, uh, it has no statistical significance. It's simply just to be able to observe where the, uh, uh, what we're seeing in the raw data. It's no, we've controlled for nothing in this in, in this process. So, um, in fact, once we control for all the things that we think we need to control for, we may find that the line has a very different slope and may slope up. Uh, and that's fine. We we're hoping that we will we will essentially. You think about our full participant base. We will have people whose lines slope up and whose lines slope down. Uh, we'll have a range of responses. Ultimately, we need to be able to generalize this information to a broader uh, set of uh, folks in our region. We need to be able to say something about what this means. Are, are we gonna, would congestion pricing really result in the kind of congestion reduction benefits that uh, everybody thinks that it would? Um, are we going to, um, uh, what, who's responding in what ways? What are the, uh, what are the equity implications of uh, such a strategy? Um, and so what we had to do was um, carefully collect uh, control data, or um, what we had to do is collect, carefully collect information about all of the participating households, but also all of the non-participating households so we would be able to uh, control for self-selection bias in our sample, to control for attrition bias that's introduced over time. So um, really this was, uh, the technology is really the component of this project that probably gets the most interest, but the bulk of the work was in the experimental design to make sure that we had, we were gonna be able to say something meaningful at the end of the project. And when we're finally done uh, in March uh, of 06, and then we have a few months of analysis, there's still a whole range of questions that we have uh, that we simply can't get to within our existing budget. So we're hoping uh, to get some more money. We've put in some grant applications for some more money to do some additional work. Um, ultimately, we need to be able to model the effects of uh, a broader application of this kind of an approach uh, from a financial perspective so that we can understand the kind of revenues also that will be generated from uh, this kind of an approach to highway finance. 
And really, you, there's a range of questions around um, how you would deploy this kind of technology um, if you were interested in deploying it. And um, most importantly is the sort of verification and enforcement side of things. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we mean, uh, what we think the implications are for deployment. Um, what we've essentially been able to demonstrate on a technology side is um, the base viability of this kind of an approach. Uh, now, the toll system that we're using is essentially was designed and is the units themselves, the onboard units, are being used in Germany already in a heavy vehicle tolling system they have there. So it's probably not, it was probably never a question of uh, is the uh, core technology viable, but really it was a question of is it viable for the kind of applications that we would be interested in seeing it used for he here in a region like ours. And, and essentially we've been able to say that in general, yes, that it looks like uh, it's a viable technology. Um, the quality of the underlying base map uh, is a very critical issue, uh, as is the quality of the GPS reception. And we obviously know that there are places that we can't receive good uh, uh, we can't receive sufficiently accurate GPS signals to be able to um, y y use this kind of a system for revenue purposes. In our case, we excluded the downtown core of Seattle. It simply was not a reliable uh, environment which to get GPS reception. There's a whole range of technologies out there to overcome that problem. Uh, and we can talk about those if people have questions about them. But um, certainly, that's an area we're interested in doing some additional testing, uh, see if we can demonstrate um, uh, the, the usability of those additional technologies to overcome some of those uh, GPS reception problems. Our, our really, the unique aspect of this project uh, is its inclusion of non-highway facilities and, uh, the, and uh, the additional complexity that, that introduces into the, um, the, op the, um, the operation of these applications. And, um, we also spent uh, some significant effort and learned something very important about the difficulty of installing hardware in participant vehicles. Um, it's, no, it's probably no surprise to anybody. It certainly wasn't. Uh, we expected this to be a significant challenge. And it uh, very much exceeded our expectations. <laughs> and um, so uh, we could talk about that. People may have be interested in that side of things. It obviously has implications for um, what kind of technology ultimately you would ever deploy and what's happening in the broader market for um, in-vehicle equipment and who's going to take responsibility for actually making sure that these components are available and usable in some format for tolling if that's desirable. Um, you know, there's huge questions about fairness. Uh, uh, you know, we, really the purpose of congestion pricing at some simplified level is to improve equity on a sort of horizontal level. So it's really asking user, different user groups to pay their, the, the portion of the cost that they're responsible for. And in this case, it's asking them to pay for the cost of congestion that they impose on other users. Um, so there's no question that if you were to deploy such a system, you would improve equity from that limited perspective. But the sort of other, the more typical way we think of equity issues is obviously has to do with, say, um, equity across income classes. Um, and, th and that's an, something we very much want to understand. So we've carefully designed our sample to hopefully be able to, um, to, be able to draw some broader conclusions about those questions. Um, we know very much from, we know, we know quite a bit from looking at individual projects uh, where choice, where, where, where paying a toll is a choice that people make uh, for a better level of service, that it's really the, it's people's marginal value of time that's important in that question. It's not their average value of time. And uh, everybody at some point has a very high marginal value of time. So, um, but this is obviously a broader application where choices are somewhat more limited. And so there are a different set of equity concerns. Um, Ultimately, if we can improve the overall efficiency of the way in which we operate and invest in highway infrastructure, um, 
and we eliminate some of those congestion externalities, society in general has more resources with which to address equity issues. Um, that doesn't, of course, mean that they will get addressed. So um, this, is, this will continue to be a very, very important issue. Um, the privacy question, it's impossible uh, to avoid this issue. It's so obviously uh, prevalent in a project like this. And um, yeah, I think that the general feeling is that these are solvable problems. Um, the tech is sort of preserving people's privacy, the privacy of their data, and ensuring that the data integrity, you know, the, the data isn't compromised in some way, or used for purposes that it shouldn't be used for. And and, and um, in Europe, they're generally more satisfied with institutional safeguards. Um, and their general approach to this question is to develop uh, uh, those institutional safeguards and legal safeguards in ways that uh, are reasonably convincing and pretty robust. But uh, I think we, uh, we have a slightly different response to these questions. It simply isn't good enough to say, uh, sort of trust us, we'll solve this problem institutionally. And so it may be that there has to be a, a, a purely technical solution to the question of how you preserve um, uh, an absolute solution to how you preserve uh, the integrity of people's information. Um, the problem I think we face right now, and there's a number of projects that have essentially taken the stance that if uh, uh, that you have to have an absolute solution to this technically, or you can't proceed. And for now, um, for at least uh, the purposes of inquiring about the usefulness of this kind of an approach to some of these problems, that probably is a pretty limiting uh, pr way to proceed because. Um, I think we would probably expect that over the next 10 years, and it's going to take certainly 10 years before anybody's seriously interested in implementing something like this, that the, the nature of this problem, both socially and, tech, and technologically, has changed dramatically. So you know, we're trying to keep an open mind about this. We want to be very upfront about these questions. And um, ultimately, any kind of system you employ has to meet some reasonable measure of political acceptability. I mean, that's a given. So, uh, but And sort of the other side of the privacy question is this question of what's a viable toll system? Uh, what's a viable toll system with GPS as its core component? And the reality is, is that um, right now, the, uh, the, me the measures of accuracy associated with GPS r signals is probably not um, it's probably not meeting anybody's legal standard for uh, um, an enforceable toll system. Uh, and I'm saying that in a speculative way. I, don't, I mean, I don't know that that's true. Uh, no one, there, there have been no legal rulings anywhere about this. But um, you, you know, the current sort of standard in electronic toll collection, you think about the standard of a license plate captured on video. That's conclusive evidence of the presence of a vehicle in an environment in which it should be paying a toll uh, is a GPS reception, you know, a GPS coordinate uh, received and stored in the back office uh, doesn't meet that same standard. And the, the answer is pr it certainly doesn't meet the same standard. Does it meet a legal standard that can allow you to actually proceed? And it's a, this is going to be an ongoing question. It may, of course, require that any system based on GPS has some redundancy in terms of other ways of capturing uh, vehicle location information. Um, and that's certainly the approach they took in Germany in the Toll Collect project, where they're using this kind of a device for heavy, heavy goods uh, vehicles, where they have a, a DSRC component or a short range communication component that communicates with both roadside and mobile enforcement units. And um, uh, you know, this ongoing trade-off between sort of essentially verification and protection of privacy has huge implications. I mean, not just for the technology, well, it's mostly for the technology employed, but the technology employed has implications for ultimately for the economic viability of any, um, of any system like this. And um, I think the... Uh, the really important question about this, uh, the outlook of something like this, beyond those very um, those significant policy questions, is you know, no one's really demonstrated a, a viable business model for this approach, um, at least as it currently um, 
uh, as things currently stand, it would require significant investment in a dedicated device that has to be retrofitted into an existing vehicle fleet. Um, uh, that will change, uh, I think, inevitably over time as some of the components, you know, the components are very simple and they're going to be part of our vehicle environment. The question is, are they going to be part of our vehicle environment in a way that allows us, uh, us or others for, other, for various purposes to uh, make use of those components by adding uh, third-party software um, and can essentially build a toll system out of existing components in the vehicle and uh, or for other kinds of value-added services that people are interested in providing. And, um, uh, you know, and also the viability of the this approach really depends on, upon the scale of the application. And you would never do something like this for a single facility where you can spend a few million dollars and equip the facility with with roadside equipment. But if you ever, you know, what they're finding right now in Germany and in some other uh, places in Europe where they have heavy vehicle, uh, direct charges for heavy vehicles, is that they're seeing significant diversion behavior off of the told uh, facilities and onto the, onto the residential streets. And, you know, that, that's just not something that they're going to be able to tolerate for very long. So they're, uh, they are very interested in looking at ways to, um, uh, to build toll systems that have some flexibility. And that's really one of the attractive components of a system like this is you don't have to go into a neighborhood and put up huge and um, uh, obstructive roadside equipment, uh, really expensive to do. You simply add some links to your roadway network and you proceed. I mean, a little more complicated than that, but so that that's really some of the business model dynamics at work. And um, uh, it'll probably be quite a while before we'll see this demonstrated in any um, any broader sense. Um, that's really what I was going to cover today, so I'm hoping that folks will have some questions and we can spend a little time talking about any aspect of this that's of interest. So, please. Matthew, uh, you mentioned that the downtown Seattle area doesn't get good GPS signals. I understood that the Siemens unit had a dead reckoning uh, capability to deal with that. Is the problem that uh, you're just completely losing it and there are too many trip ends in, in downtown Seattle? And also, how big is the area that you're not tolling? Um, uh, the, for, I'll ask, answer the second part first. Um, the area that we're not tolling is really the downtown core, um, where, where, primarily where the large buildings are. And so it's about probably 12 blocks north to south uh, and uh, 10 blocks east to west. Um, it's uh, the the uh, Siemens device, um, as is currently its current off-the-shelf co configuration of the device, actually is not using the dead reckoning. So we we aren't using the dead reckoning capabilities um, uh, in this project, and we're not using the DSRC module that also is uh, is used in Germany. And um, yeah, certainly the a range of sort of dead reckoning technologies is some is is one way you potentially overcome these problems. Um, um, I've seen some evaluation results. Uh, interestingly, I've seen some evaluation results of units that use these dead reckoning devices uh, components that actually can sometimes exacerbate the uh, the measurement problem because. Uh, you get this sort of drift off of your road, and uh, until you get the next GPS correction, you actually get a positive um, uh, correlation with a facility that you're not on in a way that simply omitting the GPS reception wouldn't uh, wouldn't result in that kind of a problem. So, um, uh, my expectation is that those capabilities um, are greatly improved over time, and um, um, you know, the other interesting thing about the sort of accuracy of some of these units, the people who do some extensive testing on this for, for toll applications um, are finding that um, some of the units that are most effective or the most accurate are, are actually really cheap GPS devices and some of the most expensive ones. I mean, if you get into the really high-end uh, GPS rece uh, receivers and you, you get a high degree of accuracy, but some of the mid-range products actually perform poorer than some of the cheaper products. So there's, there's no question there's a lot more work um, 
potentially to be done on sort of finding the right mix of components um, um, to minimize those problems. But ultimately, you can, you know, you can do, you can handle this problem in other ways too. You can develop local net, you know, uh, communication networks that essentially replicate the ability, you know, the sort of the GPS um, signal uh, to overcome the signal loss problems, and or you can um, you can do some roadside equipment, and so so a range of ways to deal with it. None of them were within our budget, so. Um, so you mentioned we're still, you know, a ways before we'll see this. What kind of timeline are you looking at um, for the for the units to actually be employed? And also, kind of a relatively unrelated question: um, What's are other cities looking at any kind of similar model like this? You said it's pretty unique, but is it being explored at all elsewhere? Well, um, uh, we've had significant interest in the project, but mostly from people outside of. Um, Outside of the U.S., um, so we've had um, some folks come over from Japan, uh, from the Czech Republic. Um, there, there's a lot of interest, especially for heavy vehicles, um, in these kind of systems, and they are already deployed for that purpose. I think that you know the other area of interest outside of the U.S. is in sort of um, area pricing, like London, the London congestion pricing zone example, and there some uh, significant interest in those kind of systems. Um, and, and you can use this kind of a device for that, uh, that kind of an approach as well. Um, and then the UK is probably sort of leading the way, in, at least on discussion, and the discussion levels on a sort of full-scale national deployment of uh, this type of uh, road user charging. Uh, but even they are talking, uh, ten, you know, 10 years before they would see some kind of deployment. Um, I think our, our interest was not in doing a pilot, a technical pilot that would lead to a full-scale deployment. So we don't have any, we don't really have any follow-on plans uh, uh, beyond sort of trying to further the discussion about these issues and and and, and uh, in a broad sense. Um, my own feeling is that it, these pieces, these components, have to be embedded in the in the vehicle before it's a, it's viable from a business. A business model perspective, and you know, it's um, your guess is probably reason is easily as good as mine about when that will happen. I, I believe it will happen, but uh, lots of questions. <laughs> sure. I'm interested in more information about the enrollment process. Um, how many people refused to participate? How many weren't eligible? Of those who agreed, how many didn't have the equipment hmm. installed? What has your attrition been? When did our and when did our attrition begin? Oh. Yeah. What has it? Oh, what, what has, has it been? the attrition been so far? Well, uh, you know, uh, from an experimental control perspective, our attrition includes everybody who, uh, to some degree, almost includes everybody who didn't participate. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we uh, it's not we, we had. Uh, I'd have to look at our numbers to see what, f how many f households met each one of those categories that you were interested in. But as I said, I think we contacted over 100,000. It may have been about 120,000 households. Um, and by that, I mean we at least made calls to them. Not everybody, um, we're not, we didn't get through to all those households. We, I think we had some more of a fairly high actual um, we had about, I believe we had about an 8% positive response rate. And, um, but some significant percentage of those folks actually didn't qualify. And then once we actually, um, once people had made it so far as to commit to the project, the period between their commitment and when they actually got equipment installed was uh, resulted in about 50% of those people actually failing to uh, go through with the installation. So that that was where we, that's where we qu didn't quite expect that amount of drop off. Um, but it, it makes sense. I mean, you know, busy people and they just sort of, you know, we, what our installation process required them to go somewhere, to make an appointment, and to go somewhere. 
Um, uh, we, we used car toys as our installation vendor, and so they had to go to one of five car, car, toy lo car toys locations in our region. Um, and they had to spend an hour, you know, sitting there while they got the equipment installed. We, we provided them with an installation incentive, but it, it was $50. I mean, it's, you know, it's something, but it's not, uh, it's not a huge amount. And um, uh, so a lot of people just simply never showed up for, uh, we, we, we were much more successful when we, what we originally did is we had, um, we can talk about this more, but we originally had, um, uh, we had the participants commit to the project, and then we called them back to make an appointment. And that wasn't working very well, so we actually had the the firm that was doing the recruitment calls when they got someone on the end who said yes and made it through the whole recruitment process. We actually had them schedule an appointment right then, and that was much more much more successful. So. Since uh, privacy seems to be a major concern, uh, in this, it's like a follow-up to the question mm -hmm. before. How many, perc what percentage backed out due to privacy reasons? Well, it's you know it's difficult for us to know. W um, we, we didn't have a lot of people backing out once they'd committed because of privacy. We had a few, maybe two or three that I knew about, um, but. Uh, what's more difficult is to make an assessment of, you know, because we had to describe this in general terms to them to ask for their participation. And so how many of those people who, we know who didn't, we kept careful records of who said no, we're not interested, and we have demographic information about those people, but we obviously don't have any information about why they chose not to. Over here. What is your criteria for breaking a tour into trips? Is it uh, shutting off the ignition, opening the door, or being stationary for some period of time? It, for uh, on, a, on a technical side, um, our um, uh, the the trip is registered as states between yeah you know, it, it's changing ignition states. So you turn the ignition on and a trip starts, and when you turn the ignition off, the unit powers down, and that's um, uh, and that's the end of a trip. That turns out to be, of course, reasonably consistent with how we do, uh, how we designate trips with, for planning purposes, at least, uh, when we do trip diaries. I mean, we ask people, if you drive to the, you, know, you drive and drop off your kids at daycare on your way to work, that's two trips. Um, you know, so um, it, it roughly corresponds. What we do see is a little bit of what we would consider to be uh, you know, what for planning on a planning level, we wouldn't consider to be a trip. Someone who starts up their vehicle in their garage and parks it on the street. You know, and that, so w that would register in our system as a trip, but it ha essentially has almost no length to it. Um, so if I were to drop someone off, that wouldn't count as two trips there. That's true, and that's yeah. an ambiguity. If you just drop someone off and didn't turn the ignition off. Um, that, in fact, would be only a single trip, and whereas we would typically call that two trips. A uh, uh, different question. You talked about the diversion from uh, arterials to local roads. Do you have a base level fee for local road use, just a mileage fee that would perhaps avoid that problem? Uh, no, we have, um, so our railway network is, um, it's a little bit hard to see from the map, but it's, all the highways and all the arterials. What's not what's not told is local collector distributors. I mean, you know, so um, you just put that on a mileage basis could. that was not on an arterial or freeway. You could, and we did. We did not. We actively did not want to do that. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm sorry. The third question okay. is: You have in Seattle some bottlenecks, like the bridges yes. and so on. Could you price those a little bit higher? Uh, you certainly can. the The system itself, the tariff model capabilities, are are um, allow for a very very high level of disaggregation of detail. Um, it's a matter of you know we talked about um, differential rates for uh, on individual facilities for directionality. It just um, for the behavioral study, it becomes so complex to understand from a user perspective that you begin to question whether the, uh, the, the information you're getting as a behavioral response to that 
uh, price signal is even in any way meaningful. So, um, yes, you, you have the technical capability to do that. Um, in the, even in the real world, you always have to balance um, uh, getting the price right uh, with uh, its understandability. Oh, you don't have a mic. Uh, if the actual uh, congestion pricing does take place and the deployment of the unit goes in the Puget Sound area, how would you deal with uh, people driving into the region mm -hmm. from other regions? I mean, since they're not going to have the actual unit in the vehicle. Yep. Um, th those, uh, again, are questions, obviously, we didn't design into our, into our system because of the behavioral study nature and because it's a behavioral study, but uh, those are very important questions for any kind of electronic payment system. Um, and, you know, the expectation is that someday, for tolling purposes, we will, someday, we will have, probably, the objective will be to have a zero cash environment. So you have to deal with that. You have to, uh, we have some examples right now. We have uh, a new toll bridge being built, and the way they'll deal with that is through video uh, video enforcement, they'll capture the license plate and they'll send you a bill. And so, you know, there's, um, there are ways to do it, but they all involve some ancillary technology. And a follow-up? Yeah. Got one more. And what, what would you think about price discrimination if there would be uh, less cost for the low-income people, you know, like that type of issue? I think, um, those are questions that would certainly, before any deployment would happen, would be, I think, very hotly debated. Um, um, it's those are policy questions. Um, you certainly could design a system that would do that. We had a question here and then in the back. Oh. Please. Yeah. Just a question of clarification was. Uh, are you collecting mileage data on local for local? Uh, yeah, VMT absolutely. On local road? We uh, we the unit itself collects second by second G, um, signal from the satellites. Uh, uh, we don't store all that. We store uh, every 250 meters, but it's sufficient to allow us to calculate mileage. Yeah, for our purposes. Yeah. In the back. We have uh, looked at that uh, at sort of what I would call an anecdotal level. So we haven't done any robust, um, uh, you know, we haven't scripted any algorithms that sc sort of scrub through the data to look for, um, at this point we haven't done that, look for distance gaps between endpoint and beginning points. We did do that um, on a more anecdot anecdotal basis for individual units that we were trying to uh, diagnose some technical issues with, and so uh, we didn't find significant anomalies in that regard. What we, you know, what you do find is um, uh, we, we we encountered some um, uh, some data loss problems for s certain vehicles. It was mostly a function of uh, you know you learn things, but um, it was mostly a function of the position of the antenna in the vehicle itself. And um, what we were, what we had is a number of antennas that were uh, uh, that had been installed too close to the actual uh, onboard unit itself, and they were actually interfering with each other. And so, um, I mean, luckily that was a reasonably easy fix. But um, you, th I think, the embedded in your question is sort of um, the avoidance behavior. And these are not hardened devices in that sense, both from a phys physically and Sort of behaviorally, there are ways to um, there are ways to deceive the device. Our premise in our project is we have um, we have uh, friendly participants, um, and and there are ways as as you as you will know. I mean, wh wh the worst thing that happens from our perspective is that they uh, they compromise the validity of the data. And we in a post experiment analysis phase where we have the luxury of really scrubbing through this information, we'll be able to isolate those cases. 
Um, the only other thing that we risk is some of the endowment account that we've provided for them. And, um, you know, that's well within our budget parameters, so. so right there. I think you were next, and then. Um, I just wondered about your mileage counting. I wondered about your mileage counting equipment, and if you had any limitations on that equipment, um, like which cars they could go into if mm -hmm. they worked with every vehicle from the participant's household. Uh, we required every vehicle in a participant household to be part of our project, absolutely. Um, there were vehicles that you simply, uh, we decided that we wouldn't have in our project. Um, there were a number of reasons for that. One is any metal, because we were not doing a hardened installation and, you know, if you were doing this um, in some permanent installation, you'd have a roof, probably a roof-mounted antenna or an embedded antenna in the vehicle. and. And we couldn't do that. So any, any metalized windshields was uh, a sort of a, uh, was, was a non-starter for their participation. Um, so there's certain vehicles that have challenging wiring configurations, mostly, you know, like Maseratis and Lamborghinis. You know, we, we basically said those were out. We didn't actually encounter a case where we had to exclude somebody for that. But What I meant was, like, the different years of vehicles that your technology um, in the device that was mounted on your dash actually worked with, it didn't matter what year? Nope. Okay. Uh, the only thing it had to allow us to do was be able to access uh, power in the vehicle. It's not tied into, you know, any of the other sensory equipment in the vehicle. E obviously, if you use the dead reckoning capabilities, you typically would be tying into some other sensory uh, um, components. And so that, that does become an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's there and there and then there. <laughs> My question relates to compensation. Um, first question is, was there any other compensation besides the endowment account leftovers and the $50 installation? Um, benefit and then also, how did you prevent the participants from kind of front loading their endowment account during that base period yeah. by driving more than they really would normally have driven? Yeah, so uh, first of all, we tried to keep them reasonably ignorant of the actual mechanics of the project until we went live with tolling. Now, as you can imagine, there's a tension there between telling them enough to for them to know that they're going to be. Uh, uh, that they want to be part of a project. And so we essentially told them they were going to be part of a uh, travel study and that we would we were guaranteeing them a base level of compensation for their participation. We told them how long they'd be participating and we told them the kind of equipment that would be installed. But we didn't tell them that there would be a control period. We didn't tell them that there would be tolls involved explicitly. And so, um, you know, they, there was very, uh, it was very unlikely that people were going to figure this out in a way that will allow them to intentionally game the base period. Um, but it, that sort of does answer the part, the second, or the first part of your question, which is you know, we, we told them there would be a base level compensation. We told them that they were, uh, they would get $50 for the installation and that we would guarantee them, that we, this is the nuance, we said we will guarantee you a um, $150 for your participation in the course of this project, but you may, in fact, depending on your household characteristics uh, and other factors, get considerably more than that. And so that is what we've guaranteed them. If they exhaust their endowment account over the course of this project, we will still give them $150 for participation. Yes? Um, since the unit of analysis is the household, I'm wondering how that worked. Um, did you have any trouble getting all household members to agree? Mm -hmm. um, did you pay individual household members? And now, as it's going on, are there situations in which some household members participate but others don't? Um, the, so to begin, uh, there were there were problems with you know, there were certainly cases where an individual in a household said, "Yes, I'm interested," but my husband or my wife. Won't, won't participate, so they were simply not part of our project. Um, <clears throat> we, we couldn't have uh, a non-equipped vehicle uh, it's for, obvi for obvious reasons. I mean, uh, once they understood the project, I mean, the temptation would be simply to use the other vehicle, and uh, that, that wasn't going to be a viable uh, from, from our project perspective. So uh, we've had a lot of things happen, or as you can imagine, over the course of the last eight months. Um, We've had households that have um, had people move out. Uh, they've moved their residential locations. All those 
present analytical challenges because their baseline, it was sort of their fundamental travel behavior changes in some way. Um, we've had uh, people had vehicles stolen. Um, it, it, lots of things happen. We, we were actually anticipating a lot more of th these kinds of issues than we've encountered. The, the, the base, uh, participant base has been a lot more stable than we thought. Um, that's probably um, a self-selection process to some degree. And, um, and our, the selection process that we imposed on the, on the, on the sample. So um, you know, that indicates the importance of being able to control for the self-selection and the attrition uh, econometrically at the end of the project. But yeah, we've had um, a number of things happen. And then we had one in the back, and then I'll come back up here. Bend over here. Um, my first question is, uh, I've read that in Singapore, their area pricing scheme, they use kind of a debit card that they charge at a grocery store or a gas station and just put that in the unit to avoid, and that avoids any privacy concerns. So I'm wondering if that technology was ever <coughs> considered. And yeah. second, secondly, um, I'm wondering what the cost of the hardware would be uh, for the general installation. Sure. Um, let's take those in reverse order. The cost of the unit itself, um, uh, to be honest, I don't know. Because we uh, contracted for a data product uh, with our vendor. And they provided the, uh, the, all the functionality that would ensure that we had a data product. Now, this is this was primarily done uh, for uh, ease of procurement. Um, as any of you who work in an environment where procurement is challenging, you will understand that what we actually have is a contract for services and not a contract for a toll system. Uh, we don't own these units. We don't have anything that has value, residual value at the end of the project. There's no. Uh, and there's no intellectual property issues because I cannot turn over to you the cost or the um, technical specifications of the toll system uh, because it's not mine. I don't have it. I didn't contract for that. And so uh, we're able to protect our, our vendors' um, uh, business interests that way as well. Um, we, uh, you can pretty easily speculate in the cost components here. I mean, you're talking probably in the range of $300 at the scale of $300, $350 plus. At the scale of deployment we're talking about, and that changes. You change the scale of deployment, that changes dramatically, as you can imagine, in any manufacturing process. And the debit, the debit issue, well, you know, the uh, um, electronic payment systems, yeah, they, they can be set up as debit, as credit, kind of. Uh, they, they have different requirements, obviously. Uh, the, um, to have a debit system, you would, uh, you would need some sort of a card reader in the device itself. You'd have to probably have the device such that it would, it, would, it would raise all sorts of other questions. You might have to have the device configured such that without the, without the debit card embedded, without the debit card inserted in the device, the device itself would prevent the vehicle from being powered. I mean, you'd have all sorts of questions you'd have to deal with. But I mean, those are really technical issues that, to some degree, it's, you know, it's like you talk to engineers, right? They can solve it. For the, for the most part, those are solvable issues. Um, but uh, you may not want to solve that problem that way. Is there something? Well, I think we're just about out of time. So before we thank Matthew for his presentation today, I want to remind everybody that there's no seminar next week. And uh, on December 2nd, we'll have Peter Wilcox, he's the president of Rivers West and Renewals Associates, talking about the Willamette River ferry options, so a ferry system in uh, downtown Portland. So with that, I'd like to thank Peter, or uh, Matthew, for his presentation today. Thanks.